Well, before we get into the last uh, lesson in our series, Family Matters, a couple uh, announcements uh, forgot to mention. Tonight at 6 p.m., uh, we will be having a deacon ordination service. Now, we haven't had one in maybe 10 or 12 or 13 years. Um, so this is a really neat and special time for our church. So at 6 p.m., uh, just turn off the TV, uh, come back on up to church, and we'll have a deacon ordination service. We're gonna, uh, four guys we're gonna um, present to you. They're gonna share a little bit about their heart. Uh, just kind of a, a challenging message to the deacons, myself, a time of worship, and then we'll have a, a fellowship time afterwards that our fellowship team has put together. Um, this is a, a neat time to, uh, as a church, we come together. And uh, so I just wanna encourage you to be a part of that. Um, so at 6 p.m. or 5.30, however long it takes you to get up to the church, just shut the, shut the game off and come back up and celebrate with us tonight. Um, also, I wanna give you an update on our associate pastor search process. Um, we have, uh, to kind of back it up a little bit, we had a business meeting back in, in August. We presented to you the search team. Um, at the end of August, uh, 1st of September, we started collecting resumes. We collected well over 60 resumes um, for the associate pastor position. Um, the team had those resumes and began to sift through from the many to a select few. The team has narrowed it down to a select few. We are starting this week with a couple in-person interviews. And so uh, we're, not, we're not trying to rush through anything, but I wanted to give you guys an update on where we are. And so we'll be praying for our team as we sit down this week a couple times with uh, a couple of men and um, who we believe have gifts and talents that our church would benefit from. And we're just seeking God's direction. And then when we as a team um, feel comfortable that this is um, God's man for our church to come in and succeed uh, the Phil Flournoy as our associate pastor, um, then we will come and bring that before you. He'll preach. Um, we'll have a question and answer time um, and voting process. So I just want to be up front with you guys. If you, I know you haven't heard anything in two or three weeks because in two or three weeks we've been gathering resumes and praying. So um, this is a little more exciting news to say than we're praying. Um, so there's, there's an update on the process. I want to let you know that between first service and second service, I switched to my points around. So on your bulletin, point one will actually be point three. Point two will be the first one I cover, point three. So it'll be like two, three, one. So if you're filling your bulletin and you're like, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Just look to the next one. I promise you the first one we'll get to. Um, but I wanna talk about forgiveness. Um, we've said multiple times throughout the family series that if you have a family, you've got family problems. If you have a marriage, you have marital problems. Um, if you're raising kids, you have problems with your kids. Um, kids, if you have parents, trust me, you have problems with your parents. Um, it, it's just the way it works. Um, there are times because we're all uh, broken people, we're sinful people, we, we sit at, dinner, at the dinner table, we've been prideful, um, we're selfish, we said things out of anger, we said things out of hurt, we said things to hurt people, um, we've hollered things down the hallway that we knew would sting because we wanted to make it sting. And today, if we don't reconcile any of that, then we just continue to pile the hurt on within the family. And so today we're talking about forgiveness. Now, with a family, I promise you, you will have ups and you'll have downs. There's times as a husband and wife, you'll sit on the couch and you'll look at each other and you'll kind of wink and go, we're doing good. And then sometimes you look at each other and you're like, I'm out of here. You know, it, you'll have your ups and downs in your family. I promise you, you will. But I promise you this, without forgiveness, you won't have a lifetime together. You won't have a lifetime together. There, there are several of us in this room right now that we know we don't go to family reunions if aunt so-and-so is gonna be there. Or if grandma so-and-so is gonna be there, we don't, we're not gonna be there. We just, it's just the way it is. And there's hurt there's unforgiveness there. And it's just a reality of what those happens. And if we don't learn what forgiveness looks like and how to walk in that, then we really won't have a lifetime together. Forgiveness is a key ingredient in the family. So the first thing I wanna talk about this is, the first thing about forgiveness is this, forgive often. Forgive often. We're gonna back it up. Point two, forgive often. 
There we go. Forgive often is where we're at. Nope, forgive often. That's the last point. There we go. Forgive often. This is my fault. I'm back there praying. I'm going, you know what? I need to switch this around. It's going to make more sense if I do it this way. And the media team's like, you're not allowed to switch it once you hit the submit button. I know. I've, I've worked in the media crew before. It's not fair to them. So this is my mistake. We're going to blame it on God. God, come on. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're not going to do that either. It's my fault. Forgive often. Look at Luke chapter 17, verses three and four. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Let's stop there. Let's say, not brother, let's say your child or your husband or your wife. If someone in your family sins, call it out. Hey, we don't talk like that in, the, in this household. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, that's, that's crossed the line. We're not gonna name call. If your family member sins, rebuke them, call them out. But if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. You must forgive him. Think of it this way. This is a command. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just tired of it. You know what Jesus would say? I don't care. You don't think I'm tired of, you don't think he's tired of some of our shenanigans? Forgive often. You don't get to come to a point in time in your life where you go, you know, I'm just done forgiving. I've, I've reached my limit. Now, understand that I understand that the, the, the calling is heavenly and the, and, the, and the execution is earthly. And I get it. There's a gap there. But that's not an excuse. It's a reality, but it's not an excuse. Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if it's seven times, he forgets to unload the dishwasher. And seven times you remind him, hey, dishes. And he says, I repent. I'm sorry. I recognize I messed up. Then seven times you forgive him. You say, what about eight times? Let's not go there. Jesus made the point and we, we're picking up what he's putting down. Forgive often. Forgiveness doesn't mean tolerance. That you're tolerant, like what I'm saying is what you're doing is okay. Because Jesus forgives our sin and never in the scriptures does Jesus say sin is okay. Right? So, so for saying forgiving someone seven times in a day is not tolerating what they're doing. Jesus Forgive sin, but it does not tolerate sin. So for us, forgiveness is not saying you're, what you did was okay. What it means is I'm choosing not to look at you or categorize you by that action. This doesn't mean that there, uh, there might not be a separating of the decision that takes place due to the harm. Doesn't mean that we, we, I'm gonna forgive you of this but for safety or for protection, it's probably best that you don't come over tomorrow. I'm not saying there can't be a separation. What it means is you're not identifying or looking at that person through their actions. You're looking at them as God has seized them and you're not holding them a captive by those actions or those words anymore. It's like when my kids messed up, I forgave them but I also had to discipline them. I didn't wait till their discipline was finished to forgive them. When they messed up, I didn't say, well, here's your punishment. And when the week was up and I gave them the phone back, we're like, just so you know, I forgive you. No, it goes like this. I messed up, I forgive you, hand me your phone. A lot of times we use forgiveness as leverage. And I just want you to know that while it may have worked 
and you manipulating your agenda, we do not find that in scripture where people have chosen to not forgive. We'll find out later what, how we're supposed to forgive. But I want you to know right now, in a family, you must forgive often, often. Now, how many times has the Lord forgiven us? More than we deserve. So how many times are you gonna forgive those? More than they deserve. More than they deserve because God has forgiven us more than we deserve. So forgive often. If someone sins, rebuke them. If they repent, you forgive them. And if seven times in one day they come back and say, I'm sorry, I messed up, you forgive them. Second thing is this, follow up with love. Follow up with love. In your forgiveness, love should be the attitude in which you are doing it. Psalms 86, five. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in what? Steadfast love to all who call upon you. Love is how we will be recognized by others that we belong to Jesus. So the way we love people. People will understand that we are a follower of Jesus by the way we love people. Love should be the driving force behind everything we do. In our discipline, when we choose to discipline our children, it's not I'm gonna discipline them because I don't want them to stop doing this behavior. It's I'm gonna discipline them because I love them. And this behavior doesn't line up with what God has called us to be or do. And because of my love for them, my love for Jesus, I need to correct the behavior. I need to correct an action. Love is the reason why we do things. What a great testimony of, of the world, of Jesus being in our lives when the world says, end it, and we extend it. When the world says, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with them. And we say, here. Because seven times in one day, if they say, I repent, and seven times in one day, I will say, I forgive you. When the world tells us to end it, Jesus calls us to extend it. Not because they deserve it, but because of what we have been given. So follow up with love. Let love be the reason why you do things. Not to stand on a fair sequel soapbox and to look at my kindness and my generosity to all those people that I've loved and forgiven us and look at me, yet we will end up talking negatively about them behind, our back, behind their backs. Love should be the reason why we do things. So follow up with love, forgive often. And the last thing is, which I wanna spend most of my time is forgive as Christ forgave. Forgive as Christ forgave. Ephesians 4.32 says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. I love how Paul starts this out. He says, be kind to one another. You know, when people say things to you, you don't always know the background behind it. I pulled into Whataburger last night to order and uh, they, they, they were talking to the speaker and I gave my order. It was kind of some blankness and I was like, hello? She's like, I'm sorry, can you just wait a second? I could have been like, it's a fast food restaurant. I'm the customer. You don't talk to people through the, through the drive-thru like that. The pastor of Bull Verde Baptist Church, I'm here to get me a Whataburger sandwich. You yelling at me? I want to speak to the manager. You know, I, I mean, I could have, I could have done. She goes, okay, I'm sorry. It's just crazy here. What's going on? What, I'm, I'm, how can I help you? Literally, that's, this lady's having, having a day. And I said, hey, sounds like things are crazy in there, huh? If you only knew, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make it real simple for you then. Here's my order. And she's like, 
I'm so sorry for the way it came. I said, hey, you got way more going on behind that speaker than I can see. Don't worry about it. You thought I would told this lady, hey, by the way, your manager's gonna come see you and give you a $3 an hour raise. She just was ecstatic. Oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. You're so kind. You know, I, I don't know what's going on back there. But if we just would be kind to one another. You're right, they had no business speaking to you in that tone. They had no business saying that about you. They had no business about whatever it is. But you know what, just be kind. Because we don't know who's carrying what baggage. And half the baggage we're carrying, we've hid it from everyone anyways. So they certainly don't know what we're carrying behind us. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. That word tenderhearted in the Greek has, this, has, a, has a word picture of let your, your inner bowels be moved for them. You ever been in a situation and you see something that just kind of is really sad and literally like your insides kind of, kind of move? Like they, they just kind of, oh, like you, you literally feel your heart just kind of sink in your chest. That's exactly what the, in, in the Greek, with this word tenderhearted, just be kind and tenderhearted. When you or engage with people, allow yourself to be moved by them. Be kind, be tenderhearted. And then here's this, forgive one another. As God in Christ has forgave you. Forgive one another. It's a command. And not doing so is living in sin. So let me put it on a really grotesque scale for you. If I had a table of cocaine and was to do a line of cocaine and choose not to forgive someone in God's eyes, they are equal. Yet in the church, we have reasons why we shouldn't forgive someone. We have reasons why we won't forgive someone, why we don't, but the cocaine, bad. Any day is bad. But you know what? So is not forgiving someone. Both will destroy your life. Just one will do it from the inside out over a long period of time through a series of broken relationships. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against you, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Bearing with one another. You know what that has, if you were, again, if you go back into the original language, it has the idea of holding someone up so they could be upright or erect. So what it looks like is weakened at Bernie's. Bearing with one another is what weakened at Bernie's. They're literally holding this guy up, walking him around like, hello, sir. And like, here, shake his hand, you know. That's what it looks like to bear with someone. My question is, church, how well are we doing that with people? How well do we do with walking around someone, picking them up, holding them by their belt loops, putting their arm around our neck, holding them upright and carrying them wherever they are going to hold them upright. We say things like, it's too difficult, it's too hard, too long of a process. My kids will never understand this, so we're just, we're just done with it. My mom and dad, they'll, they'll never get this, this part of me. They, they won't understand why I like to do this or why I don't like what the things they like, so I just give up. No, 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 bear with one another. Literally walk up next to them and hold them upright and walk next to them. Bear with one another. And if someone's got to complain against one or the other, forgive each other. How? As the Lord has forgiven you, and then Paul just repeats it just to kind of, just continue to kind of pound the same thing over and over. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Again, Paul's painting this clear picture that this is a command. So if you've got beef with someone, thou or not, forgive them. And forgiveness will always come from the offended. Forgiveness will be always be offered by the offended. Here's what I mean by that. We sinned, separation from God. Who forgave who? God forgave us. Who was sinned against? God. 
my relationship with my kids. I say, hey, don't do this. They do it. The offense comes to me. They disobeyed me. Who offers the forgiveness? I do. I offer the forgiveness. We say things like, yeah, but only if they ask for it. Only if they're willing to admit it. We forgive as Christ forgives us. However, many times, both parties have done damage, which is why he says, forgive each other. Many times there's, there's hurt on both ends. It's not just one-sided. We like to make it one-sided because we like to be the victim. The truth is, is probably there's hurt from both sides and who forgives first. You ever had an argument with your kids? Well, he pushed me. You took my Legos. And you ripped my Barbie doll heads off because you wouldn't play, you know, you wouldn't play Fortnite with me. It's like, you know, this escalates. And you're trying to like figure out how far back does this go? Parents, am I right? And you say, okay, well, who forgives first? Well, I'm not gonna say I'm sorry. Well, you, when are you gonna apologize? He, he's gonna say sorry first. He says it, then I'll say it. Here's what I'll tell you. Who forgives first? The one who truly understands forgiveness. Which is why Jesus and our relationship forgave us. Matter of fact, he loves us. Talking about love being the driving force. He loves us so much that he sent a son to die on the cross for us. That who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Before we had the opportunity us today in this room had the opportunity to sin. God chose to not only forgive us, but provide us a way back to him. Who's, who's gonna offer forgiveness? First, the one who truly understands forgiveness. And sometimes we get in this, this pettiness and we do it within our families. And all we're doing is, is Satan's loving us because all he's doing is driving a deeper and a deeper and a deeper wedge between us and our spouse or us and our kids or between our own siblings. I just paint a clear picture. The one who apologizes first, or should I say the one who forgives first is the one who understands forgiveness the best. So how, this is a great question. Some people always ask, well, how, pastor, how do I know if I've really forgiven someone? It's a real tough and deep and really long, thick question. It's kind of three-dimensional here. But here's just a real quick, a, a simple, quick uh, evaluation question. If every time you see or think about that person and the words they use to hurt you or what they did to betray you or the chances, is that how you look at them? Or you look at them through who they really are in the eyes of Jesus? When we look at that person, they walk through the back door. When our, that kid who walks through the living room, do we, are we reminded of the offenses that they've done? or do we see them in the redemptive work that Jesus has done? Question for you today, church, is what do you want to be looked at? When you walk down the hallways of your homes, when you walk through the back doors or walk in your smaller classes, how do you want to be looked at? That someone God himself is working on to sanctify and be more like him? Or for that thing you said three years ago that you said because you thought it was funny or because you were mad at the time, and you're still being held captive by that person in, in their head. Is that how you want to be remembered? And another, another question is, if you want others to view them through the same hurt that you have. When you walk up to someone and go, hey, hey, you know, you know, I, I, know, I know, you know, this person's a great small group leader, but did you, did you know? Did, did, I don't know if you know this or not, but and we're gonna tell them the things that we were hurt by because we want that person to view that person the way we view them. That's another indicator that you might not have forgiven them. So let's go back to Colossians 3.13. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. How has Christ forgiven us? Well, one is he, gave, he forgave us out of love. 
Love was his motive. Love was the reason why he did it. Love is the reason why he went to Calvary. Love for his father was the reason why he was obedient to death on the cross. For God so loved the world, love is the reason why he chose to forgave. Love should be the reason why we forgive. The other thing about the way Christ forgave us, it was deliberate and was definite. It wasn't wishy-washy. It wasn't like, well, you know, I'm really mad this time, so it's gonna take me longer to cool down. And we'll see if I'm gonna, if I can get to that point or not, if I can forgive you. First forgive us, Christ forgave us. That's not how Christ forgave us. God's like, hey, you're, you're 14. This is the third time this year we've had this conversation in prayer. And it's the third time you promised you you wouldn't be doing this stuff. It's the third time this year. You've, you know what? I'm, I'm really angry this time because I thought we had settled this issue, Paul. And Paul, this is the third time and I, I'm, I'm just up to here with it. Again, I understand that this is a heavenly calling and an earthly execution, but that's not an excuse. It's just a reality. We are called commandment to forgive as Christ forgave us. And I've yet to encounter my time of repentance with God with that kind of reaction. As we go back to what we read in Luke, seven times in a day, seven times repentance, seven times forgiven. The other thing is it was in advance. Those who have been saved, we say God's forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. In our house, we try to let our kids know as best as we can that we've already pre-forgiven them for any offense they've ever done. And they come home at 10 o'clock at night and say, hey, dad, guess what? And lay it out. I've already forgiven them. We're gonna deal with the situation but the idea of whether mom and dad are forgiven, it's, it's a done issue. If I never have to question whether God will forgive me when I go to him in prayer, then my kids on earth should never question whether I would forgive them either. Because once again, I forgive the way Christ forgave me. So you must also forgive. Now, my kids or my wife may do something that really hurts me and it may cause pain and hurt and tears, but it will never be in question whether I would or would not forgive them. Just like my sin is so offensive to Christ, whether I said or did something, I never have to question whether God himself would forgive me. Moms and dads, I wanna encourage you to Develop that type of a relationship within your homes now. And forgiveness, for, and get, saying that is not tolerating. It's not saying, hey, whatever you did was fine. It's not a big deal. No, that's not it. What I'm choosing to do is not look at my child or my wife or my peers or my friends by the action they did, but that Jesus is working in their life. Because how does God look at us? Because of what Jesus did for us, and Jesus, we've been forgiven, been washed clean with the blood of Jesus. We've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at us, he does not see the filth and the sin that we've done, but who Jesus calls us and the work that Jesus has done. And if that is how God looks at me, in my mistakes because of the righteousness of Jesus and the forgiveness that Jesus has given, then shouldn't I, as a father in my home, strive the best to look at my children, my friends, my wife, through not the offense that has happened, but who they are in Christ. I get it, it's a heavily expectation and an earthly execution but that makes no excuse for us. It's still a command. Now, another thing about it being advanced is, and I know I'm gonna probably step on some toes here and, and that's fine. I'm not trying to rock your theology here and I'm not saying it's bad theology. But nowhere in the New Testament do we see God asking us to ask him to forgive us. We see confession, we see repentance. 
But we don't see a request where God says, you must ask me for forgiveness. God God already gave it. Look at, we say things in the church like, you know, when you pray for salvation, you need to to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Believe that he's the son of God. You know, that's that's how you pray. It's the salvation prayer. And then look at the thief on the cross and he did no such thing. The thief on the cross recognized you are the Messiah. Would you remember me? Romans 10, 9 and 10, the best example of ever we have in the New Testament about a sinner's prayer. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved with the mouth that you confess, with the heart you are justified and believed. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No one there to say, would you please forgive me? Matter of fact, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you confess with your sins, or confess, if you confess your sins, I'm not saying it's wrong to walk up to someone and say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry, would you forgive me? But what if they say no? And you're like, oh. So rather, we say, you know what? I just want you to know that I messed up. Forgiveness is on the part of the offender. He says, if your, if your brother sins, rebuke him. But if he asks you to forgive him, no, no, he says, if he repents, if he confesses, if he admits what I did was wrong, I realize I have made a mistake here. You forgive. Seven times. You know, I, I understand I'm, I made a mistake just now. I'll forgive you. It doesn't say, and seven times, if he asks you, would you forgive him? You will forgive him. And I'm not saying it's, it's bad to you know, tell, teach your kids, I'm sorry, you forgive me. I'm not saying that's, that's bad. I'm just saying, I don't really see that here. And the calling from Christ for us is confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. When your brother sins, you rebuke him. But if he repents, you forgive him. If I want to be cleansed of all unrighteousness, I confess. The reason why I don't have to ask God whether he's going to forgive me or not is because I know he is. He already has. I know forever he will. What would that look like in our homes? Our kids wondering around whether or not mom or dad will forgive me or not, knowing they already have forgiveness. They just have to say, I'm sorry, I messed up. Now, some of us may go as far as say, well, I'm uh, fine, but I'm not gonna forgive them until they admit it. Is that how Jesus forgave us? Is that how Jesus chose to forgive us. I get it. This is probably not, you're like, that's not what grandma said. In our house, we, get, we have a four-step process we, get, we go through. That's fine. That's great. I'm not trying to debunk that. I just, for me in my life, I try to always go back to the scripture and say, what does Jesus require of me? What do I see lined up in the scripture? I don't want my kids to ever question whether dad's going to forgive them or not. Dad, will you forgive me? They're asking like, like, will you feed us dinner tonight? Of course we're gonna eat. You may not like it, but we're gonna eat dinner. It may be leftovers, but we're gonna eat. You don't have to ask me if I'm gonna take care of you. I will do that. But when there's sin, there'll be confession and repentance. In our homes, when there's a, a betrayal or words and there's a fight, they'll be like, I recognize the words I used to describe you were wrong and inaccurate. And I'm sorry for that. That was out of line. That's not who you are in Christ. I spoke untruth. I'm gonna admit, I'm gonna confess, I'll repent. And the forgiveness from the offender. Notice we never have to forgive God because he's never wronged us. God does all the forgiving because we've been doing all the wronging. Church, 
if we can just briefly wrap our heads around these things. Walking to our families. What would it look like? Because the thing is, rather than worrying about if I'm gonna be forgiven and am I forgiven, we can deal with the heart of the issue. Which is, why would you say those things? What brought you to the point to, to act like that at the dinner table? And we have heart transformation, which is better than behavior modification. If all we're gonna do is pretend to say the right things and pretend to behave and do all the right things on paper, but the heart is destroyed, we really have missed this whole thing. Let's stand to our feet and we'll, I'll close this in a word of prayer today. God, I thank you that before I do another dumb thing, you've already forgiven me. You've already made the decision that I'm worth keeping the relationship with. And you forgive me. That doesn't mean that I get off scot-free. God, there are plenty of times you have chastened me and humbled me and disciplined me out of my ignorance out of my stupidity, out of my sin. And I thank you for that because your love was the driving force behind that. But for our families today, God, our personal families and our church family, let us, let forgiveness be the driving force in our relationships. Let us forgive the way you forgave us. Remind us, God, how gracious you are, how loving you are, how compassionate you are, how patient you are with us. And let us bear with one another, forgiving one another, just as you have forgiven us. Thank you for that, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. At the end of the service, we're gonna have some deacons and uh, some pastors down here. If we could pray with you for anything, We'd love to. I get it. Some of the things we talked about today may, may be really hurtful and you probably need professional counseling. Kind of let you know that part of the investment of our church, belong, grow, and best is we want to help partner with you in that. If we can help pay for you to have some professional help to you to help get rid of the baggage that Satan's kind of put on your shoulders, we, we would love to do that. We want to do whatever we can for you to walk in victory. Pray you have a blessed and wonderful week. Hope to see you Wednesday night. And don't forget about the Deacon Ordination tonight, six o'clock, you're dismissed.
as the Savior's heart began to pulse again. Then the Lamb arose in glory with fire. Tell me you are great. 